Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a rant. You, you, when you read out the title, you missed about and other si pseudoscience because metrics, I like it for you. <laughs> metrics I, in my view, are pseudoscience. This has been going on for a long time. Uh, it started in earnest in the mid 90s. It's almost a quarter of a century since this thing appeared in nature. Scientists are no longer perceived exclusively as guardians of objective truth, but also as smart promoters of their own interest in a media-driven marketplace. That's not a good image to have. I'll only mention impact factors briefly because they at least have been thoroughly debunked by most sensible people, which is not to say that they're not used. They're used a great deal, unfortunately, still. This was the distribution of citations of 858 papers published in Nature, and the 80 most cited papers accounted for half of all of the citations. The mean number of citations is 114, but the median is uh, barely more than half of that, 65. Almost 70% of papers have fewer citations than the mean. One of the papers has 2,364 citations, but 35 of them have 10 or fewer citations. So it's not a, a, by no means a, a foregone conclusion that if you publish in Nature, you get a lot of citations. In 2011, I published this in The Guardian, Publish or Perish, Peer Review and the Corruption of Science. Pressure on scientists to publish has led to a situation where any paper, however bad, can be printed in a journal that claims to be peer reviewed. PubMed indexes 30 odd journals, which are pure quackery. Uh, it, it really is a pretty disgraceful, I think. They may be peer-reviewed, but they're peer-reviewed by other quacks, which doesn't help. Um, this is a very recent interchange on Twitter. I suggested that one solution was to stop buying Elsevier journals and their wretched metrics. And the excellent Cambridge librarian, Yvonne Nobis, said your lovely term, bibliobollocks, does sometimes come to mind. I'd forgotten about it, but it is entirely appropriate, I think. Publish and perish, publish or perish, I later changed in the blog to publish and perish because of the shocking story of Stefan Grimm. Employees at Imperial College Medical School, these things vary with an in institution, uh, very much from department to department. It, it, it always rather puzzles me that uh, medicine, which is meant to be the caring profession, is by far the most corrupt in, in many ways. Uh, they were told that the divisional benchmarks are to have sufficient papers in top rated journals in the speciality to ensure four publications in the RAE review period. Well, that's not too bad. But the four must be with in an impact journals with an impact factor of at least five, which is, of course, stupid. And they must have no overlap with co-authors from Imperial. No doubt they'd been sent another email saying you must collaborate and be interdisciplinary. So, so this, the, the, the rules are very inconsistent. But worst of all, the productivity target for publications is to publish three papers per annum, including one in a prestigious journal with an impact factor of at least five. So they're explicitly using impact factors. And if I publish three papers a year, I think uh, there's something wrong. Uh, one of the more satisfying um, incidents in my life was when I was on the, um, the Royal Society um, Selection Committee, a really thankless job. And, uh, and somebody was rejected for fellowship because they had too many publications. Of course, it depends on the subject in, in, in my sort of area of single ion channel kinetics. You're lucky to publish one experimental paper every two years. Um, 
citations are not correlated with impact factors. The, if you look, this was shown in 1997 by a chap called Seaglen, but it's still not commonly realized. I, I often bring it up and people uh, show surprise. They think that the number of citations you get must be correlated with the impact factor of the journal because one's calculated from the other, but there is no detectable correlation. Uh, that's because of the extreme skewness of the distribution largely. This graph shows the number of citations compared with the impact factor of the journal on log-log scale uh, for a, a few papers of mine. The Imperial College though used a thing called their publication score which was also impact factor based and therefore daft. You multiplied the impact factor of the journal by the author position weight and divide by the number of authors. The author position weight is five for the first and last authors, three for the second, two for the third and one for any other position. You, could, you couldn't make it up really. Well, they did just make it up and it's entirely arbitrary obviously and just silly. This is there's no, no correlation at all between the number of citations you get and the publication score either. Um, a senior person in Imperial College wrote to Stefan Grimm, he was a 51 year old full professor at Imperial, I am of the opinion that you are struggling to fulfill the metrics of a professorial post at Imperial College, which, including, which include maintaining established funding in a program of research with an attributable share of research spend of 200,000 pounds per year. And you must now start giving serious consideration as to whether you are performing at the expected level at Imperial College. This strikes me as desperately cruel as well as stupid. After he had that, the poor guy committed suicide. He left uh, a letter which described his treatment at Imperial. They treat academics like shit, he said, among other things. Um, I got this hold of this email from several sources. I know Times Higher Education Supplement also had it, but they didn't publish it, so I did. And the result was that it broke the server for my blog. It had a quarter of a million views, I think now, which is something of a record for my blog, at least. Um, so the trouble is with bibliometricians is that they never ever count the thing that matters, which is the quality of the work. What they do is correlate one surrogate outcome with another one. And that gets you nowhere in my view. Um, one way to look at this is to look at your own publications, I think, because you, most people have a reasonable idea of what's important. I've published two or three papers that I'd regard as making a reasonable contribution, not more than that, I don't think. Um, so, these are, these are my own citations from Google Scholar. The top citations are for chapters in a book. They were, I, this is the book on single channel recording, which was a sort of, became something of a, a Bible for people doing that sort of work. And I, I wrote three chapters in that. Uh, well, I and Fred Sigworth and I and Alan Hawkes did. It's about 235 pages altogether and they were original work. But as far as Scopus and Web of Science goes, they might, might as well not exist. That, that seems to me really absurd.
The next one was a paper in which I played really a, only a small part, almost as small as the penultimate author, Jeffrey Bernstock, who I think hadn't read it at the time it, the proofs came. <laughs> so much for giving away five to the last author. Um, so that that's, uh, the paper was perfectly good, I think. The next one is another textbook, so that doesn't count either. They're the only things that have over a thousand citations. The next thing is contained no original work at all. It was a review. So that doesn't, uh, shouldn't count anything like as high as that. This one, I also had a small role in it and but both of the ones where I say I had a small role, I now regret having my name on at all, especially this one, which has had 887 citations because the result is quite possibly wrong. I'm not sure, but it could well be. Now we get to the first real paper. <laughs> it's well, fairly well down the list. This was a paper in the Journal of Physiology without a particularly glamorous impact factor, but the co-author was rather famous mm -hmm. and it was, it was a 56 page paper, printed pages, uh, and it was a result of five years work. That's probably the first good one. Then we come on to a theoretical paper in 1981 in which the theory was done in a really quite ham-fisted way. Um, it was not wrong, I think, and it had some practical examples in it which may have been of value, uh, but the theory was not done in an optimum way. And the next year we wrote another one doing it very much better uh, that has far fewer citations. Then we get to 743 citation. This was a, a, the outcome of a three month vacation job in Bern, which was great fun but because I had some rather eminent co-authors, um, Erwin Nair, who shared the Nobel Prize with Sackman, Harold Reuter, an eminent physiologist, and Chuck Stevens, also a very well-known physiologist. There were so many of us that we, we couldn't all work at the rig at the same time, so it wasn't even three months of full-time work. <laughs> That's ridiculous that it should have so many citations. This one is the first theory paper with Hawkes, which there's a whole story behind that, but I won't go into it because it's not relevant now. And this is the, this is the good version of the 1981 paper. It's in 1982, it's 59 pages long with 400 equations in matrix algebra. So it, it, it has been fairly well cited. I, I wouldn't like to guess how many people have read most of it, none I should guess. Then we come amazingly to a 2014 paper, quite recent, uh, which was about p-values. That's something I'll be talking about on May the 6th to the UCL Statistics Department. It's a sort of post-retirement hobby to keep me off the streets, as I say in the blog. Um, it was some rather naive simulations. And the assumptions that I made weren't explained very well in that. I, I understand them better now. But it, it was not, by any standards, a great paper, yet it had 574 citations. And it had that number because, because the subject is of wide interest at the moment. P-values are a bit of a hot topic. And, and because it was fairly accessible, it wasn't very mathematical. Um, and, and so on. This one from 1992 
was fairly well cited, but it had a very eminent co-author, Bert Sackman. And it is really quite a boring paper, I regret to say. It was a lovely year that I spent in Heidelberg, but it's, it's not a, a terrific paper. And this, this is the first one that I published on single iron channels with Bert Sackman. It had 392 citations, which is okay, I guess, because it was, it was quite original at the time. It's really a sort of abstracted version of the 1985 one in the Journal of Physiology, which quite rightly has far more citations. That's okay. So that's, Gives you the idea. This is the 2014 statistics paper I was referring to. I was amazed to find that the PDF has been downloaded 280,000 times, which is just ridiculous. I mean, it was a, a, a naive and simplistic paper. But of course, it was a paper that was sort of timely because it's a fashionable topic. And if you look at the citations in Google Scholar, you see that they come from every field under the sun. They come from everything from particle physics to insect ecology. Because they all use tests of significance, they all cite it. It's nothing to do with the number of citations. It's nothing to do with the merit of the paper. It's entirely to do with the size of the audience. Um, more examples of the lack of correlation between citations and the impact factor of the journal. I've published one paper. How do I get rid of this thing which is obscuring my view? Um, I, I, I think uh, that says that I published a paper in Nature with about 80 citations and an article in Philosophical tra Transactions of the Royal Society, Impact Factor 3.1 with 750. There's really no correlation at all. Um, another example. In 1975, we had a letter in Nature with Chuck Stevens. It turned out that it was wrong. We did the experiments again in, in London and corrected it in 92. The wrong one has 134 citations, but the right one has only 81. Anyway, that's enough of my work. That homily does depend on my own assessment of the quality. Uh, a, a better way, I think, of looking at quality is to look at somebody whom everyone believes is at the top in their field. The trouble with bibliometricians is they look at mass correlations and you can't measure the quality of so many papers. It's much better to look at individual examples in my view. The names of Bert Sackman and Erwin Nair may not be familiar to everybody, it depends on your field but they got the Nobel Prize in 1991 for their development of the patch clamp, which is a method that allowed the first observations of current through single molecules, through single ion channels. And that, that was a huge uh, development. It's noticeable actually that uh, this, this is Bert Sackman in, in, in girting and dissecting a muscle. It, it's, it's noticeable that Every Nobel Prize winner that I've known personally, which there are four, I guess, they all did the experiments themselves. They didn't at the time they did the work have big labs and they did their own experiments. This is out of fashion, I know. But it's important, I think. But if Sackman had been working at Imperial College rather than the Max Planck Institute, He'd have been fired before he ever got to that stage. Let's just look at some of the numbers. Think of the decade from 1976 to 1985. The Nobel Prize was in 1991, so this is when the bulk of the work for which they got it was done. 
in this decade, Sackman failed to achieve Imperial's publication score in six of the 10 years. The failed years included 1976, when they published their first paper showing single molecules, which was the single molecule currents, which was the foundation for the Nobel Prize, and 1985, when we wrote our 56 page paper, which is the only one I've ever written that's been um, nominated for uh, as a classic paper. And that was published in the Journal of Physiology, not in any uh, glam journal. In two of those 10 years, he had no publications at all. Great sin. In 1981, he published a methods paper in a journal with a tiny impact factor, Fluger's Archive, now, now uh, the European Journal of Physiology, and that's had 20,000 citations now. So by these impact factor criteria, based criteria imposed by Imperial, Sackman would have been fired, so would Peter Higgs from Edinburgh, and less importantly, so would I, because I didn't publish much to begin with. What these performance managers don't realize is that you have, if you want to get novel research, you have to put up with a great deal of failure. Now, fairly recently, people have made serious attempts to do something about this. Among them, Stephen Curry, things have improved, I think, as a result of his efforts at Imperial, though I don't think that, judging by some of the emails I get there, and they're far from perfect there, and, and many, as they are in many other places. For example, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment says don't use journal-based metrics to assess individuals which is you know, sort of late in the day, Eugene Garfield, who invented the wretched things, has said that years ago. It shouldn't need saying, but it certainly does. Um, until recently, despite that, UCL's promotion form said candidates may wish to provide impact factors, citation rates, or other bibliometric information when appropriate. Um, I, I was uh, very upset by that. It didn't affect me because I'd already reached the, uh, the, the full professorship by the time I saw it. Most people would take that as an instruction to provide them. So I wrote to all the members of the promotion committee and gave them several good reasons why this was a daft thing to add. And the result was I got a bollocking from some official in HR who said it was inappropriate for me to write to them. Why the hell is it inappropriate for me to write to the members of the promotion committee in my own institution? Hey ho. Um, and these things are still going on. Just very recently, Liverpool University was proposing to fire 47 members of staff based on criteria which are just absurd. A calculation of average research income over a five-year period. This is, of course, is what Imperial did and what other universities have done. They value expensive research over cheap research. If you can do good, great stuff with a pencil and paper costing next to nothing, you get fired for it. If you do very expensive research, you get promoted. This is uh, the Taxpayers Alliance should get upset about that, <laughs> but um, they don't. The other thing that we're going to use is the field weighted citation impact score. Now Elsevier says that this is the ratio of the document citations to the average number of citations received by all similar documents. So I asked Elsevier uh, about three or four weeks ago, initially in anticipation of this talk, how is similarity judged? 
what happens when the source journal publishes a very wide range of subjects, and what happens when a mathematical paper is published in a biological journal. The University of Liverpool thing breaches the Dora Agreement, it breaches the Leiden Manifesto and the Hong Kong principles. It's, it's just uh, ghastly. When I asked these questions to Elsevier, this is what they told me. Similarity is judged by three criteria, year of publication, document type and discipline. The first two are easy to define. The discipline is defined by the all science classification codes used to classify journals. Or well, how the hell do you classify nature in that case? It publishes on everything. The year of publication is the only um, an ambiguous one. Unless the scope of the journal has changed drastically, the uh, classification codes reflect the focus of the journal, albeit to a general degree, so roughly. And if the article was a mathematical contribution to the field of biology, then the field weighted citation impact would not be a worthwhile metric as that aspect of similarity would not do it justice. So I followed it up with another question. Even if you have the multi if they have the multidisciplinary code, other facets would be used to determine the classification and aspect. That's what they told me. So which other facets would be used to determine it? And who decides which subject a particular paper in the multidisciplinary field is assigned to? Does a person decide, and if so, whom? Or does an algorithm decide, and if so, is the algorithm published? I've repeated this question several times over the last two weeks and I still haven't got an answer. I think it's almost certain that the algorithm isn't published. So Liverpool University is farming its decisions about who to fire to a commercial company based on an unpublished algorithm. That is just disgraceful. Um, I wonder how they uh, classify this paper, which is probably the best theory paper we wrote in 1996. It gave the basis for maximum likelihood fitting of single channel records. It is uh, really quite hard mathematically, and that's not the sort of thing that gets you a lot of citations. And then of course, citations uh, can be high because a paper is dreadful. Uh, another paper with over a thousand citations was Wakefield's now fraudulent paper published in the Lancet. That's only 0.03% only, only of papers in the Web of Science have been cited more than a thousand times. Not that the Web of Science gets its citations right, but it's, it's pretty rare anyway. This article was published, retracted in two stages in 2004, that's six years after it was published. And then there was a partial retraction. Then in 2010, the editor of the Lancet, Lancet retracted it entirely. It took 12 years before the Lancet and Elsevier Journal published, uh, retracted it entirely despite the fact that a, a, a heroic journalist, Brian Deere, had shown that the paper was not just wrong, but actually involved fraud. It took a journalist to make an Elsevier journal retract the paper very late. If you look at the citations, they were mostly negative after the first few years, at least the, this um, dark gray area is citations that refer to it in a negative way. Th this uh, buff color here is the citations that refer to it in a positive way. You can see that the citations have gone on unabated. Uh, they, they, they were unperturbed by the partial retraction. 
in 2004, the, even the affirmative ones carried on at much the same rate. After the full retraction, uh, they, they wane. There aren't many affirmative attractions now, but of course the, the huge damage has been done. We all know at the moment the value of vaccination and this particular fraud, which is still being perpetuated in America by Wakefield, was, uh, was to blame. Um, another problem with citations is they take time to accumulate. I've already alluded to my probabilist friend, Alan Hawkes, with whom we've published a lot on single iron channels. But his most cited paper with 1600 citations was written before even I met him. It was in 1971. And that paper went on with a handful of citations throughout the time we were writing our uh, single channel papers. And almost all of those citations have come since 2004 or so. By this time, Hawkes had retired. It's a very good job he wasn't, re wasn't uh, relying on this paper for his promotion because he wouldn't have got it. It has turned out to be of interest to financial people. That's why it's uh, suddenly bloomed and that's what he's best known for now even more so than the single channel work where he did heroically difficult stuff so I think these examples suffice to show that citations are exceedingly dodgy as a, a measure of quality I mean, quality isn't even judgeable at the time, even if you read the paper, which of course is what you should do. It's often very difficult, if not impossible, to judge how important it will turn out to be. That, that last example of Alan Hawkes shows that very clearly, I think. Um, part of the responsible metrics movement, uh, I, I was drawn to my attention through this site, um, which is a good, a good thing in principle. The trouble is that they, these people take it upon themselves to explain metrics to us, whereas what they should be doing is saying, save the money and don't buy the bloody things because they don't tell you anything useful. Um, th there were two generally good attempts to explain how to use metrics responsibly. Um, one by Lizzie Gad, whom I have a little of regard for. But on the question of whether you can use citation as a proxy, proxy for quality or impact or excellence is somewhat questionable in terms of construct validity where you can say that again but she then goes on to say there's considerable evidence that citation counts correlate with peer review judgments sufficiently in some fields to justify their use in research evaluation well i looked up the references for those and the correlations are lousy actually they just don't in my view there was another uh, good piece on that site uh, and I think uh, Gray is at UCL, I think. Um, he said, giving multiple indicators helps to reduce the effect of outlier papers affecting the calculations. And now that's, I think that's absolutely the opposite of the truth. It's the outlier papers, which are the interesting ones. The ones, the, the, the ones that stand out, most people don't publish a lot of papers with huge impact. <laughs> Ooh, yuck. Um, but the ones they do are, are the outliers. They're the good ones. <laughs> you don't want to reduce their influence necessarily. 
And they say more accurately, I think, than the first example, the justification for using citations as a proxy, a proxy for quality or excellence is highly debated. I don't think, well, you can say that again, it just doesn't exist in my view. Um, Hannah Fry, fate rather famous uh, now mathematician from UCL, famous because of her radio broadcasts with that in Rutherford, um, published a paper on Goodhart's Law, which pointed out that using GDP to indicate a country's economic well-being doesn't make sense because by that metric, a school teacher con could contribute more to a nation's economic success by assaulting a student and being sent to a high security prison than by educating the student because of all the labor that the teacher's incarceration would create. Numbers are a poor substitute for the richness and color of the real world. It might seem odd that a professional mathematician like me or an economist like Tim Harford would work to convince you of that fact. But to count well, we need humility to know what can't or shouldn't be counted, like citations, for example. How's the time going? Okay. Um, An, another attempt to tackle this question was the one commissioned by Hefsey, which resulted in the publication of the metric tide. They invited submissions and I sent one and here's some extracts from it. Citations may be high because a paper is good and useful. They equally may be high because a paper is bad. No commercial supplier makes any distinction between these possibilities. It wouldn't be in their commercial interest to spend time on it. Citations take far too long to appear to be a useful way to judge recent work, even if they're a useful way to judge any work. And this is especially damaging to young researchers and to people, particularly women, obviously, who have taken a career break. Also, the counts don't take into account the citation half-life, a paper that's still being cited 20 years after it was written, is clearly had influence, but it takes 20 years to discover that, which makes it as useless as a criterion for appointing people. As I pointed out, the commercial ones miss out too much to be a good uh, indicator anyway. In particular, they miss out book chapters, which is really disgraceful. Um, and of course, citation counts can be manipulated. The easiest way to get a large number of citations is to do no original research whatsoever, but to write reviews in popular areas. You could see how Highly, uh, one of our own reviews was um, was rated, but despite having no original work in it at all, or, or to write indecisive papers about nutritional epidemiology, a notorious way of getting a lot of citations for work which is frequently fairly useless. The gaming of citations is easier, though I strongly object to the word gaming. If students do it, it's called cheating. If academics do it, it's called gaming. That won't do. But if Hefsey makes money dependent on citations, then the sort of it'll, it'll take place on an industrial scale. It shouldn't do, of course, but it would. And that would be disguised, no doubt, by some ingenious, ingenious bureaucratic euphemisms. There's a wonderful example from computer science where somebody wrote a program that generates spoof papers in computer science by stringing together plausible phases, phrases that you read in a sort of random order. A hundred such nonsense papers were accepted for publication. And 
they managed to fool Google Scholar into awarding the entirely fictitious author of these papers an H index which was bigger than that of Einstein. I mean, this is uh, the, well, it's a more recent equivalent, I guess, of the wonderful spoof paper by um, Alan Sokal that did so much to debunk postmodernist philosophers. And of course, the use of citation counts encourages guest authorships and uh, marginally honest behavior of that sort. There's no way to tell whether, whether an author on a paper has actually made any substantial contribution to the work, despite the fact that some journals ask for a statement about that contribution. Those statements can just be made up, of course, and often are. This is another nice example, which was taken down not by an academic, but by the excellent German magazine Der Spiegel about university rankings. It was noticed that the Times Higher Education World University Rankings, a slightly obscure German university in Bielefeld, jumped almost 100 positions in the ranking. And they found that 10 articles alone accounted for as much as 20% of Bielefeld's over, overall citations in those two years. And each of these 10 papers could be linked to the Global Burden of Disease Study, all but one of which were published in The Lancet, which is a high impact factor. And each one was co-signed by hundreds of authors one of which came from Bielefeld. That's just nonsense. Lastly, and leastly, altmetrics. This has a huge potential for corruption. Here's an example. New England Journal of Medicine. Oops. Published a paper or primary prevention of cardiovascular disease with the Mediterranean diet. Anything with the diet in the title uh, immediately gets tweeted a lot. It was tweeted by the New England Journal of Medicine itself, first of all. Our new post focuses on a trial that shows Mediterranean diet results in less, they should have said fewer, of course, cardiovascular events than a low-fat diet. Somebody else said a huge study in New England Journal of Medicine, Mediterranean diet is shown to ward off heart attacks. And there were more trivial one, get your nuts and virgin oil here, primary prevention of cardiovascular disease with a Mediterranean diet. It very rapidly rack, racked up over 2,000 tweets. Not one of those tweets mentioned the fact, including the one from New England Journal of Medicine, that the diets had no detectable effect on myocardial infarction, no detectable effect on death from cardiovac cardiovascular causes, or no mm -hmm. detectable effect on death from any cause. The only difference they found was in the number of people who had strokes, and that showed a very unimpressive P equals 0.04. So the risk of it being false was really quite large. That's a different talk though. So if you can't use citations and you can't use impact factors or any of these other things, how are you going to appoint people or give them grants? Well, I came across, I, I, I've said often how I used to do it. You used to ask them to submit their two or three or four best papers because depending on their age and we or somebody who understood the area would read them carefully. And then at interview, we would ask them questions about their own papers, especially about the methods section in my case. It's amazing how few people, <laughs> um, how, how, how often it occurred that somebody 
had only actually done figure seven and didn't know much about the rest of the paper. That, that's very revealing. But then I came across a marvelous uh, thing from 2012 from the head of chemistry at Stanford that described what they do. And this is a, uh, a model, I think. It's a bit long, but I'll read it out and then I'll stop. In the Stanford chemistry department, I tell the younger faculty we hire that they must meet three criteria to achieve tenure. First, they must be good departmental citizens. Our department is a small one. And we need to work, everyone to work together for common good. Um, that's really important, I think. There's nothing so miserable as working in a, a department where people are rowing all the time. The, I think the pharmacology department at UCL was a, a good example of a small department where people worked together well until it was abolished and merged into a huge department. And that's another story too. <laughs> Second, they must become good teachers. We'd be delighted if they become great teachers, but we only ask that they become good ones because everyone who really wants to achieve that status can do so. Third, the department wants them to be great researchers. This is the most difficult and it presents the greatest challenge to our beginning faculty. How are we to judge whether someone is a great researcher? Of course, all tenured faculty members vote, but the process goes through many other layers of university inspection and consideration. So it's important to define the criterion of, for researchers as best we can. The greatness of a faculty member is not judged simply by the members of the department, but rather by 10 or 15 external letters we collect from experts outside the department. The question, oops. we ask isn't how much they publish, but how, how much the um, candidate has changed the view of chemistry in a positive way. It is not based on how much funds the candidate has brought, brought to the university in the form of grants. It is not based on the number of publications. It is not based on some elaborate algorithm that weighs publications in journals according to the impact factor. It is based simply on establishing new knowledge. As a department, we do not discuss H index metrics. We do not count publications or rank them as to who is first author. We just ask the candidate, has the candidate really changed significantly how we understand chemistry? We believe that our criteria lead to appointing the best faculty that we can. We also think that it is Uh, well, that, that's uh, that speaks for itself. And lastly, they make a very good point. Of course, our procedures are not perfect. Sometimes we tenure people who afterwards show less interest in research than we had imagined they would. That happens, of course. Uh, I've made, I think, mistakes in appointing people well, I say mistakes, they haven't perhaps turned out to be the researcher I thought that they would be, but they've done other good work for the department in the form of teaching or other things. That's the best they can do. So I would conclude impact factors have been shown to be harmful for uh, it's longer than 20 years now, uh, 30 at least. They're statistically illiterate, shun anyone who uses them. Citation counts do not measure quality. They depend largely on the size of the audience and the easiness of the topic. More maths is fewer citations. In other words, metrics appeal to the enumerate, those who can't read and judge for themselves. The H index is absurd. It depends on age and group size, not quality. An altmetrics is a measure of how much time you spend on social media and your ingenuity in including words like sex or memory or penis in the title of a paper. It could well be 
negatively correlated with real quality. All metrics encourage short-termism, corner cutting and outright dishonesty. They contribute to the crisis in reproducibility that is in Guild Science very clearly, and that they mean sometimes that jobs go to dishonest spiff scientists. Metrics are a way to make money for legacy publish publishers. We bet be better off without the metrics and the publishers, both corrupt science. Okay, that's the end of the rant. Thank you, David. Um, if those of you online could turn your cameras on. Um, we usually stay over time, so feel free to ask questions. Thank you so much. So who wants to go first with any questions, comments? You can raise the hand on um, Zoom or just Jerva, I see your hand, yes. If, uh, if I may, this is not my original idea, but I attended a talk earlier this morning about how to tackle um, antimicrobial resistance. And one of the proposal was that instead of publishing via uh, science fiction journals and via patent, we could publish through regulatory um, framework just so that the data can be shared with the regulators and the, um, the scientists can be protected via the framework that is regulation. So perhaps um, a way to judge the, the metrics of studies would be to how useful it is to tackle real, um, I guess, issues scientifically or, or socially but then that would not address basic research. But anyway, it's just a thought of perhaps another way to put the measurement is to, to judge it via how useful it is to, um, to the society. Uh, yes, I think you might have difficulty getting agreement on how useful anything is to society. I don't, I don't think um, measurements of single molecule currents are very useful to society, at least in the short run. When I started, I hoped that they would revolutionize drug discovery, but that uh, if, if it ever happens, it, has, it won't happen in my lifetime, I fear. Uh, so you just can't really tell. And, and it, it would take a long time as well. So it wouldn't be useful for judging people for jobs, for example. Martin. Hello. Um... Hello. I would, I would like to, to, to add another perspective that, you know, did not come through uh, directly through what, what David said. And one important argument that one always hears in favor of bibliometrics is they are a measure that is objective. And it is said that, oh, we need an objective measure because we have a problem with favoritism. And we can beat favoritism by objectivity. However, that's not a good argument. The way you can beat favoritism is through transparency, not through something that you think is objective, but actually there's no such thing as objectivity. It doesn't work. In particular, citations are not, not objective. Citations are the result of a social process. And in fact, the nice citations uh, by that paper by Hawks uh, kind of demonstrates what happens if you have a researcher who is far ahead in thinking. Because the crowd will only engage with people who are at approximately the same stage and not with those who are far ahead. I think this is causes a really a problem for the advancement of science because if we look at citations within you know, a short period after something gets published, we give the support to the people who are five to 10 years behind. Anything like that, you can say that like a job in your department. And I got one, it, it, it is so desperately unfair, but I can't do anything to remedy that obviously. I, I, I would say that in the end, quantity doesn't pay if you if you publish 
10 salami sliced papers a year and you're asked to submit your two best ones as you should be but aren't always then you're going to be in trouble <laughs> because they'll all be thin I think when I was promoted it was a very different time of course but I got promoted on the strength of really only two or three papers I think that I'd written they were long ones and they were not too bad but they weren't anything special I don't think uh, but they were they were long and they were thorough now of course if you've got on a three-year grant you may not have time for that that's the awful thing uh, but it did pay for me and maybe it will maybe if you can do it it would help <laughs> i just feel desperately sorry for young people at the moment and, and uh, that, that's why I feel so strongly that they shouldn't be judged on metrics, but rather on the sort of criteria that that uh, chemistry professor gave. But they're not very frequently. Thank you, David. So we have a question from Jack and then one from Lisa. Okay, so my question is this, and first of all, I must confess to having cited your easy accessible stats paper, and it, and it was actually, and I think papers like that get cited because they, they capture a mood, right? So you, you may have felt it was a, not a very useful contribution, but I, I don't know, I think there's a sort of lump and mass of people like me found a very useful way of explaining, uh, uh, explaining to others uh, uh, something that someone had already explained. But anyway, my, my question is this, can you see a way out of the current situation? Is there a way of rolling it back or are we stuck with it? I think there are real attempts to roll it back now. They're not working very well yet and, and too many staff are not even aware of them, I suspect. Uh, you know, the, bi the busy lab head running a huge lab with lots of people churning out papers by the dozen probably isn't even aware of Dora and those things. I know plenty of people like that, unfortunately. But it's a start uh, and it'll grow from, from there. It, I think it's going to take a long time, but I, I think it might be rolled back eventually. It, it's, um, it's maybe over optimistic <laughs> because it's, Trouble is, it's not always in the interest of lab heads to believe these things, the more spiff type of lab head at least. But um, they will eventually become aware of them. They'll become aware of things like, well, I, I wonder who it was who devised these criteria the Liverpool University used, the, the field weighted citation impact. Is he aware that he, they're very fallible. Is he aware that the algorithm by which they're calculated isn't even published? Uh, I, it's these rather senior people who have to be persuaded to behave differently, I fear. But there's lots of pressure on them to do so now, and that, that can only be a good thing. Thank you. Lisa, go um, next. Thank you very much. Um, David, thank you for that really good talk. Uh, in fact, quite a lot of your points slightly synergize with the talk that uh, John and I did on peer review earlier. I've got three comments. One is just to say that I've actually seen firsthand where peer review can be manipulated to get people to increase their citations. So dreadfully that this happens. We've seen instances, not very often, where <laughs> hiding behind the anonymity of the single blind peer review, you can actually get some reviewers insisting that 20 or 40 or 50% of the citations in the review are actually of their own. So that's a rather malign practice that needs to be just borne in mind with this. The second point that you raised is about transparency and how journals have got this complete sort of author contribution statement I think the reason why they included that, even though it doesn't necessarily 
um, unfortunately make a real difference to the problem is that they are supposedly showing an element of transparency by having the contribution. The trouble is if you've got, I don't know, six authors on a paper and four did practically zilch, they just are on it because they are big names, they rubber stamped it or and in the hope that they might, you know, attract more citations, but they've literally done nothing contributing in terms of the intellectual um, or practical part of the paper. How are journals supposed to police that? Even if they ask someone to comment on what their contribution is, they can just lie. So it's just a comment there about how we go about policing the so-called act of transparency when actually counterintuitively it might <laughs> perpetuate the lies. And then the final thought that I have is taking my inspiration from cigarettes. <laughs> Of course, in the last few years, we've made cigarettes brand lists. So when you go to buy them, even though we know that they cause death, you can't ask for Marlboro this or whatever the brand is. They've become brand lists. You just have the you know, warning sign on the packet. Is it worth thinking about having brand list citations? Maybe we shouldn't name the journal. After all, discoverability of an article is just through a DOI. If you had all references without any name, of whether it's science, cell, nature, and all these different things, it's literally telling you where you can find it. That might also stop the practice of requesting where the publications are. Just a thought. I'd be interested in your views. I think that last idea is a great one, actually. We don't actually need journals anymore. We don't need commercial journals. I think we'd be better off without them. I mean, Nature could make a nice news magazine. It has a good news section. But it shouldn't be publishing research papers. Peter Lawrence, who is a lovely uh, molecular biologist from Cambridge, uh, said that the average Nature paper has the density of a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> and they're most unsatisfactory. And I feel a bit guilty because in 2008, I published the first article we've ever done in Nature. And it was, I, I was quite pleased with the work, but the publication was awful. You know, endless uh, supplementary material, um, short method sections, uh, and I would far rather have published it in a, a journal that would have let me publish something three times the length. Uh, but the postdoc needed it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I sort of acquiesced to the pressure in that sense, which I'm not very proud of, but uh, he, he's, moved, he's moved on to the LMB in Cambridge, so maybe it did some good <laughs> for, for him. Um, what, was the, what were the first points you raised? The, the first point was just to do with the fact that peer review can sometimes be manipulated, especially when it's single blind, so that people can actually insist on their own work or body of work being cited in preference to others. So that's where sometimes the sort of uh, manipulation of the metrics can occur, even through peer review. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. I don't have a solution necessarily, but it's just other than the editor should perhaps take a greater responsibility in spotting those type of requests and make sure that they liaise with either independent people or the peer reviewer in question to say what is the justification for having such a high number of your own bodies of work in preference to the existing data or something like that. But um, that was that was one of them. Well. I, this makes me feel slightly guilty because when refereeing, I have occasionally thought that they missed out papers of mine that should have been published. I, I, I tend to say that in a, a direct message to the editors so they can decide if it's appropriate rather than to the to the um, the, sub, the person submitting the paper. It can be appropriate and it can be inappropriate, but it wouldn't matter if we stopped counting by these citations. Yeah, fair, fair enough. I mean, I don't think it's wrong if a referee makes one or two suggestions for a couple of really important citations, but when you start seeing them suggesting 8, 10, 12, well, <laughs> referencing it is, say, 70, it's nonsense, isn't it, right? <laughs> that, is, that is really nonsense, obviously, mm. yes. And, yeah. and then my other, sorry, question, because I realise I had several, was to do with the author contribution statements and how do we police that? Because if people are in fact going to lie about that having a genuine contribution, it's difficult for journals, even though in the guise of transparency, they might be trying to 
do something towards making it clear what the different you know sort of uh, contributions of the authors are how, how can that be sort of better uh, put into the public domain in a way where it again isn't being somehow manipulated I don't think it can be policed mm. um, <laughs> I, I, I can probably say this of the late Jeffrey Bernstock whom I alluded to before as not having read a paper on which he was the last author or penultimate author um, it's said of him that when he left Australia before he even came to UCL his goodbye gift one of them was a rubber stamp which when you stamped it on the paper said and Jeffrey Bernstock <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was rather notorious for it. He's very proud of having published over a thousand papers, but I, that doesn't seem to me, as I said, to be anything to be proud of at all. <laughs> but you can't police it. It's, it's better than nothing, but it probably is largely nothing. Mm. Thank we, you. We keep on with it anyway, I think. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. I, uh, very interestingly, you raised all the um, negative issues that come through this use of metrics. Um, I think what really, really undermines it is the commercial nature of it. And because their popular popularity went through the roof over the last few decades, especially with the development of the internet. And there's another very social aspect of it because you mentioned Nobel Prize winners, and this is elite uh, measure of metrics because any prize is a metric, and we do know the cases where Nobel Prize probably was awarded by mistake and should not have been given to those people who history has shown that. And um, it's one of these things where, you know, you look at students, you look at many researchers, they're immensely proud that they got published in The Lancet, which is uh, the top rated journal. They're immensely proud that they have a particular metric score and they chase it, just like they chase the number of followers, just like they chase the, the kind of recognition in numerical value speaks volumes for those who need to judge you. And uh, there is this incredible marketing pool and consumer pool. We all know about cigarettes and Coca-Cola and they're still the most successful items on the market with extreme demand. So it's almost like you know how bad it is and those producing metrics know it's going nowhere because it's making incredible money and it's still judging, well, it's leading the hearts. So. My question, or thought it, I don't know, it's maybe a question for all, if we get to this place where everyone behaves like Stanford chemistry department and we do get different promotional judgments of what would be the role of metrics because it'll still be there. It'll be for judgment in between each other, uh, personal judgments, but... Oh, the <laughs> The metrics wouldn't be there if we didn't pay for them. Clarivate, I discovered this morning, a subsidiary of Thomson Reuters, much used by universities, mm -hmm. had, had revenues of almost a billion pounds. That, that's not, that's not uh, uh, Thomson Reuters, that's just Clarivate. And that's coming out of university budgets. It's ridiculous. We should just stop buying the damn things. <laughs> But those who produce them, you realize they will never let that in go. They will do everything to keep that business going. So oh, oh, they do, yes. I, I, was, I do wonder how appropriate it is to, to let people who are selling something like Clarivate to write in about responsible metrics because their whole business model is to produce irresponsible metrics. Damn it. I mean, they can write some bland stuff, which doesn't sound too bad, but you know that they're, they're, they, they make money and their jobs depend on selling irresponsible metrics because if they're available, they will be abused. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was very cheered when uh, California, I think the entire California, stopped buying Elsevier journals. Is that still the case? I don't know. And this, this is what we should do. We pay billions to Elsevier uh, and, and we just shouldn't do. If uni universities would just have the courage to say no, then uh, things could only improve. Mm. 
but they won't. David, I think the other problem, though, with what you just said is don't forget that a lot of these open access journals, they still make their money instead of it being the reader buying it. It's the author with their exorbitant nine, ten thousand pounds article processing charge. So even if you end up making it being the authors that pay through their funding body, <laughs> we've got a it's a tough nut to crack, if you see what I mean. Oh, oh it is. <coughs> Excuse me. It, it, it is a tough nut to crack, but I, mean, I sometimes wonder if we need journals at all. The standards appear mm. if you are so fallible. Mm. Maybe just put everything on a preprint server yeah. and then people can judge it when they read it. It's, it's, it's happening actually already. Yeah. Um, people don't, especially in physics, don't much care about the journals anymore. They put it on archive and, and people will read it and judge it. I believe that when Nature pub experimented with post-publication peer review, they found people unwilling to do it, but I think that would change with time. Uh, I, I think you could probably abolish the entire scientific publishing racket, because that's what it, it has become, and and uh, just use preprint -pre service. It shouldn't cost more than hundred dollars to publish a paper. Disk space is cheap these days yeah. uh, and uh, nature charging ten thousand pounds is just uh, Well you're quite right and the other thing to the other elephant in the room with all this is that of course anything that's um, NIH funded automatically whether or not you've paid in a subscription journal open access you have to pub deposit everything in pub cent PubMed Central anyway after 12 months so effectively stuff you've paid for as the consumer ends up being free on PubMed anyway. So what are you paying for? Yes, it really, it really has got out of hand. <laughs> it's got out of hand because publishers make so much money out of it. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, and that's because universities pay up and they shouldn't pay up in my yeah. view. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the interesting discussion. We're 20 minutes past the hour. So David, excellent talk. Tomorrow we should have uh, the recording online. And we hope to see you all in two weeks. Good. Right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.